Let's pray. Our Father, I'm not sure what it is you have in store for us today, but the tone and the attitude of the music seems to have set a stage for some of us to do some pretty serious business with you. And so, Father, I trust the, the busyness of our lives and the clutter that comes across the airways of our news channels and across the pages of our newspapers that we can put all that aside for a brief time and we can find out what it is that you have to say to us. We'll not worry about what we think others need to hear you say to them, but we will simply, significantly, and purposefully be intent on listening to what you have to say to me personally. And Father, I trust by the end of our time together today that the desires of your heart will be met in the submissiveness of our choices. And so I trust that to you today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. The last few weeks, by the way, thanks to Nick for filling in on uh, Mother's Day. Uh, while we were gone, I had the privilege of... Uh, helping one of the families in our church son find a wife, and um, it was successful. Um, they are married and on their honeymoon still yet today, so that's terrific for them. Um, but we're looking at this idea of personal transformation of our own lives, your life, my life. This is kind of a wrap-up to the 30-week series that we did on what are the 10 key biblical truths that we ought to be thinking about in which we build our life on. When we know the truth, and the Bible says the truth will set us free, but the truth sets us free to be obedient. We know the truth, then there needs to be some action which follows that truth. And so these two work hand in hand. Know this, obedience produces this, so that these two things bring about what is God's purpose and vision for all of us, and that is to be like Him. And these are the ten key characteristics of God Himself, that His vision for us is that we be conformed to the image of His dear Son. And eight of these are the fruit of the Spirit outlined for us in the book of Galatians chapter 5, and the other two, hope and humility, are significant characteristics that we find throughout the Scripture of who God is and what God offers to us. You see, God the Father wants to give to you and me as His children His DNA, he wants us to learn to look like Him. He wants us to behave like Him. He wants, when the world looks at His children, for them to say, wow, they look a lot like their father. Nothing would bring Him greater joy than to hear that in our life. So we're looking at this subject for today and probably next week, and then we'll bring this portion to a close. However, we will never stop talking about transformation of life here at New Hope, because that is an ongoing process until one of two things happen. Do you know what one of those two things might be? Yeah, you die, all right? And then the Scripture says to be absent from this body, to be present with the Lord, there will be an instant change in all of us to perfection. And for some of you, it will be a much more significant change than others, okay? <laughs> Some people get saved and stay right where they are and the, fi the finished work, so there's not much done in the meantime, but God would like us to be closer and closer to His image by the time He calls us home. What's the other option? We die or He comes again, all right? And then we are caught up with Him instantaneously to be transformed into His image. So you and I as believers are to be constantly engaged in this process of transformation in our life. But I think a lot of Christians view transformation like this particular woman did. A woman testified to the transformation that was going on in her life that had resulted through her experience of conversion as she accepted Christ in her life at her home church. She declared a week later, I'm so glad I got religion. You all know how much I love that word, right? She said, I'm so glad I got religion. I have an uncle I used to hate so much. I vowed I would never go to his funeral. But now, I'd be happy to go to it anytime. I'm not sure that is complete transformation, all right? 
Uh, but many of us find ourselves maybe caught up in there, and quite frankly, that's what religion does to us. Uh, up on the screen, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to be a little techie today. We'll see. Okay. And, and I've got to learn how to get print bigger on my computer so it shows up bigger here, but um, I'm going to read to you what it says up there anyway. Um, but Jesus is inviting every single one of us to become a new person. He wants us to keep this, what do I think about? How do I act? And who am I becoming revolution? He wants to keep this turning until we go to be with him in eternity. And Jesus, with his invitation of transformation, wants three things to happen. First of all, he wants to heal us from our past. He wants us to put shame and pain and guilt in our rearview mirror. He wants them to be gone from our future. Number two, Jesus wants to make a difference in our present, right where we are today. He wants us to experience the fullness of Christ's blessings right now. And number three, he wants to invite us to be fully involved, fully engaged in his future plans. And what's that? That you and I someday get to return to the garden of his new kingdom that he is building for us throughout all eternity. He says that you and I will have a new heaven and a new earth to enjoy for all of eternity. Just a side note. Just because some people get the idea, I'm not too excited about heaven because I don't want to just sit on a cloud. Guys, you, you, you'll not be sitting on clouds. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And don't ask me to explain it because I don't fully understand it all. Here's what I know is, he says, there'll be a new heaven and there will be a new earth and that you and I will be the dwellers of this new heaven and this new earth. So we'll get to see a Yosemite and its perfection. We will get to see however he shapes this new world, all right, with all that he has to offer, and we will get to enjoy it with absolute perfection. So it's not just sitting around. It's not just being part of a choir forever. Some of you says, that doesn't sound like much fun. I don't know if there'll be Harleys on the new earth or not, all right? But, man, if not, you'll get to view the world in ways that would be even better than on the back of a Harley. It's going to be grand. Here's what... Here's what Jesus left this earth telling his disciples. He gave to them an amazing promise, and he offered to them a compelling invitation. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. While you're still here living in a troubled world, he said, don't let your hearts get troubled. Why? Because if you believe in God, my Father, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. And if this wasn't true, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back. I'm going to take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also. And then this last line, you know the way to the place where I am going. And of course, one of the disciples spoke up and said something. He'd have been better off keeping his mouth shut on. He said, Lord, we don't know the way. Yeah, we do. We just have to recognize it. Jesus had been telling them all along. Jesus then follows that up with these words, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. You see, the way is this. It's the truth. It's building our life on who Jesus Christ is. This is the truth. We build our life on the truth, then we have the way to where He is. And it's said on many other occasions, it's like this, that the vision of God for you and me is to conform us to the image of His dear Son. Well, when we think this, and when we do this, we are this. And that's the way, the truth, and the life. And that's God's vision for us. How, how are we doing with that vision in our life? Jesus is not only preparing a place for us, but he is also in this life preparing us for that place. You see, we just don't get saved and wait until we go to the place. We invite Christ in our life, and then he begins to prepare us for the place he has prepared for us. The entire movement of Jesus is empowered by his presence. 
Just as a giant wind turbine only gets turned by the unseen wind that blows, so our lives and the church turn from the wind movement of God's presence in the person of His Holy Spirit in our life. The wind of the Spirit is activated in our lives when we do exactly what Jesus did every day of His life while on earth. He submitted His life to the will of the Father, and He relied on the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish everything that He said or did. Imagine, imagine if you can, millions of small spiritual windmills rotating in sync throughout every neighborhood and every city in the world. This is Christ's vision, and He's wanting you and I to become a part of His vision. I hope and pray by now that every one of us are ready to declare our allegiance to Jesus Christ, not to New Hope Church, not to a creed that's called Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or Protestantism, but I hope you and I are prepared to declare our allegiance to Jesus Christ that we will begin the think, act, and be revolution in our own life to become the new person that Christ has a vision for us to be. And He extends an invitation to us to truly live for a noble cause, the building of God's own kingdom. Jesus doesn't ask us to be a dead offering, but He asks us to be a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Put up, uh, put up slide number two if you would. You see, right now, it's time to make a life-changing decision if you haven't already made it. You can't straddle the line anymore. No riding the fence. In the 8 o'clock service, I didn't have technology. So I had to have them pull out a piece of paper and draw a circle and a line in the middle of it and do in and out. I, you guys don't have that. So here's what I want you to do. And you're, I, I, I probably should have had you draw it on your own paper. But here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to choose which word you're going to circle for your life right now. Am I in or am I out? Am I in or am I out? And here's the deal. If you don't choose either one, you've chosen out. You have to choose in to be in. You have to make no choice at all to be out. Choosing the bottom half signifies I am turning down Christ's invitation. Choosing the top half signifies I am accepting His invitation to the full. I want heaven to be my eternal home. And between now and then, I want to allow Him to prepare me for where I will spend eternity. If this morning you circled in your minds, I, I'm out. The question I have to ask for you today is this. Why? Why are you out? Why do you not want to spend eternity in a place called heaven? Why do you not want to be forgiven of your sin? Why do you not want to have your guilt erased? Why do you not want your life to be better than you can wildly imagine? Do you need more information? Do you need more time? Do you have some tough questions that you want answered first? Or are all those excuses? If those are genuine questions, genuine concerns, then I encourage you, look for a trusted Christian. Look for a pastor to get answers that you need. Find the answers to your why questions. But know that Jesus' grace and mercy are available and ready for you at a moment's notice. I pray that you find your answers and the truth soon so you can come back to this line again and announce, I'm in. I'm in. I had a gentleman. I don't know if he's in. I haven't had a chance to look around real thoroughly. Uh, Andy, are you in this service? Andy? I think it's 1045 service. Andy made an appointment with me two weeks ago. I did not know Andy, though he tells me that we'd met before. I'd done a wedding for their family. It was about 12 years ago. It, um, I was young then. I'm old now. And so I, don't, I, I, did, I didn't remember, and I, I hate to say that. But, but Andy had been coming a couple of weeks with his sister. And, uh, 
he made an appointment to come see me personally. And so he walks in, and I, I shook hands with him and had him sit down. I said, Andy, I'm so glad you made this appointment. I really enjoyed getting better acquainted with folks. Just don't have time on Sunday mornings to do that. So I, I relish this opportunity. And then I said what I often say to folks when I don't know why they're coming to see me. I say, tell me what's going on. Listen to what he said. First thing out of his mouth is, I want to get saved. That doesn't happen often, all right? You know, usually you're trying to pull that out, all right? And in this case, right off the bat, I'm here to get saved. Whoa, Andy, that's great. Man, I said, I said we're going to pray really quick, okay? Um, but I said, just, I said, you do know you didn't have to make an appointment to come see me to get saved? I said, you, 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 you know, I'm not the one who's going to save you. I, don't, I want to be sure. He said, oh, I, I know what's God. He said, I just wanted to be here. And I, I said, well, that's great, so let's do it, and then we'll talk some more. And so he, I, I said, do you, want, do you want me to word a prayer? And you pray after me? He said, no, I think I can do this. And he sat there and he prayed. And he invited Christ into his life. He's 52, 53 years old, all right? And he could circle, I'm in. I'm in. He'd made the decision no longer to wait. Still had some questions, but he said, those questions aren't big enough to keep me out. I'm in. You see, if you circle, I'm in. I want to make sure that you tell somebody about it. In fact, I'd love for you to tell everybody the fact that you're in. The Apostle Paul writes, it is with our heart that we believe and are justified. It is with our mouth we profess our faith and are saved. For you, the next question may well be, what now? Deciding to change your life as well as to join the mission to change the world can seem a little overwhelming. It's like a mosquito that flies into the middle of an outdoor picnic you know what to do, you're just not sure where to start. So I'd like to give you a few practical steps, whether you're brand new at being in or whether you've been in and stuck for a long time. Let's look at a few practical steps today. I highlighted these, um, these three things uh, at the beginning of this 30-week series. God, I love it when you anticipate me. Uh-oh, Ashley's starting to think like me. That's dangerous. Um, but, but I'm going to go in depth these a little bit. Most of us know the word vim, vigor, and vitality, all right? Well, this is the word vim. And um, there, there, there's a, a brilliant man by the name of Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard, who is now in heaven, by the way, uh, this guy had multiple PhDs, uh, taught down at Biola and Talbot Seminary here in California, uh, just really was a good, brilliant mind and thinker. And Dallas Willard knew that sometimes when he wrote, he wrote over the heads of people to understand. Because he, he really, he was in a different plateau than, than I certainly am. And, and so he asked Randy Frazee if he would write a student version of a really good book that he had written, something that, that, that could, was easier to understand. And the title of the book was Renovation of the Heart. And that's what we've been looking at these last few weeks is the renovation of our heart, all right? For out of the heart proceed the issues of life. How do we take the truth from our head, move it 12 to 18 inches to our heart, and let it transform us? In the process of reading and rewriting the book, Randy became convinced once and for all of the importance of the surrender of his heart, not just the head in this journey called the Christian life. And in this book, Dr. Willard lays out the important threefold process using this word vim to get believers motivated and moving. That's a problem. We want to be motivated and moving. Vim comes from a Latin word, and it means to have direction, to have strength, to have power, to have motivation, to have energy, to have vigor. Willard cleverly uses the word as an anacronym, V-I-M. We need vision, we need intention, and we need the means. So we're going to look at that. Parents and teachers and pastors often fail to move students along in progress because we start with the means and we ignore the vision. We give orders, we give commands, we make demands, things like make your bed, eat your vegetables, shoulders back, do your homework, read your Bible, mow the lawn, do good deeds. This strategy fails almost every time. We may get good behavior, but we don't get transformation. It certainly worked that way in Randy's own life. He said there was a time in high school that he struggled, he struggled desperately. He was bored out of his mind. Fortunately, with loving discipline, he graduated from high school, and he weak-eked his way with his grades into college. 
But after a year in college, an interesting thing happened. He had the decision, the clarity that he was supposed to become a pastor. Now he had a vision for his life, and suddenly, with this clear picture in mind, he knew where he was going. The classes he was taking now began to make sense. He was motivated because there was a goal that was in sight. After two semesters of learning how to study, he earned straight A's for the rest of his time in school. He even got his master's degree without anybody telling him that he should or he must. Willard concludes that we often fail in our leadership because we put the means in front of the vision. You see, putting the cart of means before the horse of vision just doesn't work. Maybe this will help understand that last, that last comment. There was a mother whose son went off to college. After about four months of him being gone, she went to visit him. She showed up at his dorm room unannounced. Upon entering her son's room, her eyes swept the walls, which were covered with more than a dozen suggestive pictures of slightly clad young ladies. Her heart was grieved, but she didn't say a word. She didn't say, tear those down, which most of us might be inclined to do. Instead, several days later, after she left, the mailman delivered a package to the young man. It was a gift from his mother. It was a beautifully framed picture of the head of Christ. with it a note that says, I hope you'll put this above your desk and remember to trust Him for everything you do. It was his mother. She was paying for his education. She said, send him a gift. So he hung the picture on the wall above his desk. And every night before he went to bed, he would look at that picture. And the first night, he noticed where the eyes of Jesus were looking straight at. And so he removed the first pinup off of the wall. And every night, he would notice that Jesus' eyes had moved to a different pinup. And by the time the week was over, the only picture that remained on his wall was the picture of his Savior. That's a tremendous example of this incredible work that God wants to do in our life. He wants to transform us from where we are to who Christ is. That's His goal. That's His desire for us. Are you in cooperation with His vision for your life? We must begin with that vision until we embrace that vision in our heart. Transformation will nearly be impossible. So here we go. Let's in depth look at vision. V for vision. All right. The first step is to embrace the vision of Jesus for our life. Jesus wants us to be like Him. So we need to ask ourselves some questions. Okay? Here's 10 questions. How would my life improve in my relationship? And by the way, when I say, how would my life, the intent of that is not for you to answer with, how would Tim's life be? The, the, the my is a personal pronoun for you. See, I'm not saying, how would your life, I'm not pointing my finger at you, okay? So I don't want you to point your finger at me. So this, I'm, I'm saying this in the first person, it's the way all of us should ask this question to ourselves. Are, are we clear on that? Okay, all right. So question number one, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I sacrificially and unconditionally loved and forgave others? Does that not go along with love? Okay, question number two, how would my life improve and my relationship be strengthened if I had inner contentment and purpose in spite of my circumstances? That's connected to the principle, the truth of joy in my life. How would my life improve and relationships be strengthened if I was free from anxiety because things are right with God and others? How about a little peace in your life, huh? Question number four, how would my life improve and my relationship be strengthened if I took a long time to overheat and endure patiently under life's pressures? Did you find one that goes with that? How about patience? How would my life improve and my relationship be strengthened if I chose to do the right things in my relationship with others? How about kindness and goodness? Do I need to keep saying the first half of this question every time? How would my life and my relationships? Okay, good. Um, 
if I established a good name with God and others based on my long-term loyalty in those relationships? How about faithfulness? How would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I was thoughtful, calm, and considerate in my dealing with others? Gentleness, good, yeah, gentle. How would my life, pop, dot, 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 if I had the power through Christ to control myself? Life under control, yeah. How would my life improve and my relationship be strengthened if I coped with hardships and faced with courage the prospects of death through hope I have in Jesus Christ? And how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I chose to esteem others above myself? Humility. You see, if we become this type of person, what kind of difference does this make in our life? What difference would it make in the lives of people around us if this became our constant behavior mode? We would see a community filled with the qualities of God. This is a description of life in the kingdom to come. We wouldn't be surprised that people would want to move to California if this is the way our communities acted. Jesus is inviting us to start living this new way of life right now. Do you truly want to be this kind of person? Is this your vision? Is becoming like Him more important to you than your career, how much money you make, how many degrees you might collect? This list goes on and on. Have you grasped the implications, the outcomes, the freedoms this vision offers to us? Do we realize how likely we will be more successful in every era of our life if we become this kind of person? For me as a parent, for me as a parent, Chad was in the last service. Ashley is in this one. I can say without reservation that I want each one of my children more than anything else in my life. I want my children to be this kind of person. And for those of you who may not be parents, I trust you can say that you want those you love the most to be this kind of person. And if we want that for those we love, then we must show them the way by the pattern of our lives heading in that direction. The Apostle Paul writes, join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you have seen us model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. On days, on days when I might be willing to settle for less, or take shortcuts to secure temporal outcomes, I get reminded of the legacy that I'm passing on to my children. Is it good? Is it right? Is it biblical? To want to become like Jesus for the sake of others. And progressively, this vision is overtaking my life. I enjoy running, short distances preferably. It's one of the reasons why I run when I go to the Ivory Coast. Some of you have heard me say this. When I, when three years ago, I went to the Ivory Coast for the very first time. My primary responsibility is the first thing every morning, and I speak to the team before they all go out. They're the team from America, so they all understand English with a slight oaky accent. And, 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 and so we're good there. But then the rest of the day, most of my relationship is with people who I cannot communicate verbally with. They don't understand my accent. They don't understand my language. And so I prayed. I remember I prayed that first day there, God, how can I somehow, some way communicate to those you've sent us to touch their lives? How can I communicate your love in me to them? So I got a notion I could do it by running. I thought of Forrest Gump. <laughs> and so when I, when, I, when I cross the line of the compound where our tents are, it's anywhere from 50 to 75 yards, maybe 100 yards, to each of the three buildings to where either the patients are preparing for surgery, are going to for surgery, or are being taken for post-op afterwards. And those who've been, they, they know this is true. I'm not making this up. When I leave the campground, I run literally to the next building. And when I leave that building, sometimes I'm carrying a, um, um, yeah, um, a stretcher. Thank you very much. I, I'm carrying a stretcher, all right, so we can transport them from one place. I literally run. And so what happens is, is after a while, uh, some of the Avorians will ask one of the translators, why does that crazy white man run? And they didn't know, and so they would get me and say, hey, he has a question for you. And so they would translate, and I would say, you tell him, 
that the God who's sitting me here loves them with all of his heart. And he wants me to let them know that I love them too. And I can't, sh- I can't explain it to them with my words. I can only show it to them with my actions. I am here for a short period of time, and I want to touch as many of their lives with the love of God as I possibly can, and I don't have any time to waste. And that has opened doors for ongoing dialogue. How can you and I allow what God does in us to make a difference in the lives of others? Pop-up slide number four, if you would. You'll see in this slide a box. That box is to represent our key vision, your key vision, mine. There's a list of topics, and they may be hard for some of you from uh, the last four rows to read, so I'm just going to go through them real quickly. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you a list of options, a vision for your life. You can only take one vision as your primary vision and put it in the box. What vision would you put in this box? I want to be famous. I want to be rich. I want to make a difference. I want to be like Jesus. I want to succeed in my career. I want to be smart. I want to serve God. I want to own a big house. I want to drive the car of my dreams. I want to be beautiful. I want to be a celebrity. I want to be a successful athlete. I want to be married. I want to have a family. While none of these are inherently wrong and most are absolutely good, the one vision Jesus says will properly drive all of them is the one that says to be like Jesus. Becoming like Jesus will bring a depth of satisfaction in our relationship, not only with God, but with others around us. This sums up Scripture's goal for us. If we become like Him, all other things will take their proper place in life. If we didn't select to be like Jesus option, it's okay. Pretending will get you nowhere. In fact, many Christians say that Jesus is their vision, but daily they live out one of those other options. Being honest is the first step of getting things right. It has to be the longing of our heart, not anybody else's, the longing of your heart, of my heart. We need to know, however, that unless we choose to be like Jesus, the next two steps in this threefold process will be drudgery. If you did choose to be like Jesus, the next letter in the VIM process will guide you into steady progress. And the next letter is I, and you can take things off the screen if you would like to now. Intention. All of our children developed, all of our children, mine and Shelley's, developed a vision in their hearts for independence. And they demonstrated this, first off, all three of them, by getting their driver's license. Okay? All three of them. I mentioned this in the early service. Chad popped off. He said, yeah, and remember, Brant flunked his the first time. That's the smart one who flunked, all right? And, and some of you are saying, how dare you call one of them smart? Well, he, he is in book knowledge usually. Um, but, but, but anyway, so the younger brother who didn't always get as good a grades relished the fact that he passed the driving test before his older brother. But they both, all, all of them, I think you were a week late going on your 16th or did you go right on your birthday? You were a week late, weren't you? But, but within that first week or two, all three of the kids got their first card of independence, a driver's license. They owned the vision, and so they intentionally made a point of getting their driver's license as quickly as they possibly could, and they all successfully achieved their goal. You see, intention follows vision. A person who has a vision but no intention is a mere dreamer. Our children needed more than just a vision for independence. They needed to form an intention and a plan. So it is with spiritual life as well. We must be intentional. We must be deliberate, premeditative, calculating, purposeful about becoming like Him. Peter sums it up this way. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and goodness knowledge, to godliness mutual affection and mutual affection and love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, get the picture? You never come to where you've got enough of any of these. They are always increasing. I'll fight it. These things will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. But whoever does not do these things will be nearsighted and blind, and they will forget that their past has been cleansed. Roseanne, who is uh, not Roseanne from TV, she would not be a good sermon example, okay? Roseanne, who was Randy Frazee's bride of over 30 years, she wanted to learn more about specific areas in her life that needed attention and maybe 
some change. After completing a spiritual self-assessment tool, the results showed one fruit was slightly bruised and in need of attention. It was the virtue of joy in her life. Of the four statements defining biblical joy, Randy's wife seemed to have the most difficulty with this statement. Circumstances do not dictate my mood. Circumstances do not dictate my mood. In the assessment, Rosanna received feedback from several close friends and family members. I hope she didn't ask her husband. The folks she asked to rate her in this rated Roseanne lower on this statement than she rated herself, which isn't an unusual thing to have happen. For most of us, the area we need to grow in the most is the one we can't see or we can't at least see as clearly as others do. While we don't mean to, we often deceive ourselves. Self-introspection simply isn't sufficient to propel us to real and lasting change in our lives. So Roseanne went through a painful process in which she realized some specific things in her life that weren't lining up with Christ. And the process she went through started out like this. First of all, she denied it. This isn't true about me. She then went through the next stage, which is anger. Who do you think you are evaluating me anyway? She forgot she had asked them. Number three, victimization. Why are you guys picking on me? I just ask a question. Number four, rationalization. Well, okay, maybe they have a point, but it's only because of the circumstances I'm in. And number five, acceptance. The people who evaluated me took a risk, and they spoke the truth. They did it with love as they see my life. They care about me and want to help me. This must be true about me. And eventually, Roseanne came to the place of acceptance. And Randy says, I can remember the day my wife owned up to this lack of joy in her life. She recognized that in Christ, she had the power to overcome her circumstances and experience joy. But she had never moved it from her head to her heart. And so she was able now to move from vision to be like Jesus to intent to have inner contentment and purpose in spite of circumstance. Do you think people who intentionally establish a goal to move towards their vision are more likely to accomplish it than those who don't? Yes. Regent University used the 30 key areas that we have looked at over the last 30 weeks, and they used it to conduct a study comparing those who had both vision and a goal for spiritual development with those who only had a vision but no plan for how they were going to grow, the findings, those with a clear goal and intent grew considerably more than those who played it by ear. This was true for the early disciples. It's true for Roseanne. It will be true for me, and it will be true for you as well. Vision must be followed with laser-focused intention. And the number three means, I think we can do this. Yeah, I got six minutes. To move beyond mere good intentions, we need to put in place a thoughtful, practical plan for progressing into Christ-likeness. We have to believe that God is personal. He cares about my daily life. And so Roseanne, as she looked for ways to grow in the arena of joy in her life, she identified four practices that helped her. Number one, she did a Bible study on the truths out of the Scripture that God is personal. Through this experience, she said, I not only want to believe it in my head, I want to put it in my heart. The next thing she did is she did a personal Bible study on joy, and she studied the book of Philippians, which is the biblical treatise on the subject of joy. The author of, of Philippians was Paul, and he wrote it while he was under house arrest, under incarceration, and he writes a book on joy. And Paul teaches in the book of Philippians, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is praiseworthy, think about such things. What you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. She then began to engage more frequently in worship and prayer. She engaged in a unique experience of worship that introduced a specific physical exercise program along with the music that she listened to and sang with while she was exercising. The endorphins released through exercise brought a more positive outlook, and as she gave a discipline to prayer and worship, her life was filled with greater joy. And last of all, the fourth thing she did was she engaged uh, in better biblical community. 
By confessing to her family and her small group her struggles and desire to grow, she invited them to help her along the way. And Randy said it was interesting when Roseanne would begin to experience less joy in her life or appear to be controlled by her circumstances, the people in her small group would give her the look, whatever the look was. And he said, never say a word. And she would say, oh, I'm heading backwards, aren't I? Randy was intentional. Randy's wife was intentional with the vision that she had. David Yarbrough tells a story from one of Max Licato's books of a lady who had a small house in Ireland at the turn of the century. She was quite wealthy, but also very frugal. And the people were surprised when she decided to be the first to have electricity installed in her home. A couple of months after installation, the meter reader appeared at her door and he asked her, is the electrical connection working? She said, oh, it's working just fine. And he said, well, ma'am, I'm wondering, the meter shows that you scarcely use it at all. How come? She said, oh, I'm certainly using it. Every evening when the sun sets, I turn on my lights just long enough to light my candles. Then I turn them off. Yarbrough goes on to say she tapped into the power but did not use it. Her house is connected but not altered. Oh, man, don't you and I often make the same mistake? Our souls are saved, but our hearts are unchanged. We're connected, but we're not altered. We're trusting Christ for heaven, but we're resisting His transformation today. For all of us who are serious about becoming a new person in Christ, the process of sanctification will not happen overnight. Each step of the grace-filled walk will breathe life into our weary, guilt-widden souls, but it starts with a vision that's moved by intention, that knows the means whereby to accomplish the vision. John D. Rockefeller Sr. was strong and husky when he was young. Early in his life, he determined to earn a lot of money, and he drove himself to the limits. And at age 33, he earned his first million dollars. At age 43, he controlled the biggest company in the world. At age 53, he was the richest man on earth and the world's first billionaire. Then he developed a sickness called, I can't say the word, somebody told me at 8 o'clock, but A-L-O-P-E-C-I-A, alopecia, okay? It's where the hair of the head falls off, the eyelashes, the eyebrows disappear. He was shrunken in like a mummy. His weekly income was $1 million, but all he could eat was milk and crackers. He was so hated in Pennsylvania, he had to have bodyguards. He could not sleep. He stopped smiling. He enjoyed nothing about his life. The doctors predicted he would not live past his 54th birthday. The newspapers had gleefully written his obituary in advance for convenience and sudden use. Those sleepless nights set him thinking. He realized with the new light, I cannot take one dime of all this money into the next world. Money was no longer everything to him. God was displeased with a sinful life. Then and there, he surrendered his life to Christ, repented of his sins, pleaded for God to change his heart, and the next morning, he awoke a new man. He began to help churches with his amassed wealth. The poor and the needy were not overlooked. He established the Rockefeller Foundation, whose funding of medical research led to the discovery of penicillin and other wonder drugs still in use today. John D. began to sleep well, eat and enjoy life, and you can say he began to live life to the fullest, and the man who was supposed to die at 54, I believe, made it to his mid-80s. Why? Because of a change of heart and transformation. Are you prepared for that? Right now, the only decision you need to make is to say, yes, I'm in. If you are in, all in, on a count of three, would you say, I'm in? One, two, three, I'm in. Oh, that wasn't all that good. One, two, three, I'm in. Stay in. If you're not in, find out why find out why. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this incredible truth, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the transforming influence and power of our life. Christ in us, the one who prepares us now for the prepared place that we will spend all eternity. Father, a life in heaven with you is not sitting on a cloud strumming a harp and a Life on this earth is not dull or boring or unsatisfying. I pray somehow by the winds of your Holy Spirit, you've taken what what has been said today that I hope arises right out of the very truth of your word and let us know we want to be in both now 
and forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.